So, let's go back to 1985. I wasn't even born yet, but it was the first time of the Robo Olympics. Robots competed to see who can jump the highest or who can best fold origami, help someone cross the road, and even to see who can bark the furthest. It's true, a long distance barking competition. At least that's what this robot told me. This is Hero, and Hero asked me to be its coach for the upcoming Robo Olympics. Isn't it, Hero? Hey, Mike, it is cool and all that you are giving this talk. But we should really prepare for the long distance barking competition. I am not sure about my bark. Can you give me some feedback? Well, it needs to be a bit louder. I am not sure how to do that. Why don't you show me how it is done? You mean right now? Yeah. Fine. Wuff, wuff, wuff. That was hardly any louder than my bark. Try again. Wuff, 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 wuff. That was amazing. I just might use that one. <laughs> okay, great. Well, this was one of the conversations children can have with Hero. And these conversations are designed to, to um, reduce stress for children with cancer in the hospital. And it were the children themselves who named the robot Hero. It clearly signals what they need in the hospital. And although that this Hero cannot cure them, it can brighten their day through the stories they create together. And in those stories, the child gets to be the hero and help, ro and he and help the robot, like being coming its coach for the Robo Olympics. And with this simple yet powerful narrative, a lot is achieved. By needing help, the robot is painted as imperfect, and it not only um, makes children more forgiving towards mistakes made by the robot, it also reduces their expectations, because if they expect too much, they get disappointed, and they, uh, the magic goes away. This narrative of needing help also gives children a purpose. It's a reason for them to keep interacting with the robot, but it also gives them a sense of agency in the hospital, a place where this is heavily reduced. And creating these meaningful interactions between people and robots is not easy. I would even argue that it's the main reason why we don't see a lot of these social robots in our society yet. The technology in terms of robotics and artificial intelligence or AI is mostly there. Yes, of course, a lot of, a lot of things can be improved, but not enough to explain why, we, why these robots on, aren't deployed on a much larger scale. Companies have tried and failed. And I believe this is due to a lack of vision on what a meaningful interaction is, and also a lack of effort that is needed to create engaging content, and by, and by content I mean these nice little conversations we just saw. And um, this talk is not about how I will revolutionize the field. It's not even about how the latest advances in generative AI will, is the answer we're looking for, like chat GPT. It's not, it's not the answer. It would have made sense, though, since I'm an AI researcher. No, this talk is a love letter. It's about me professing my love for a much older profession. <laughs> Maybe even the oldest profession. And it's not the one you're thinking of right now. Of course, <laughs> I'm talking about storytellers and ultimately writers. So writers have the unique ability to capture the human experience through language and storytelling. They can create vivid and compelling characters that you can relate to and care about, even if they're robots. A great thing about literary writers is their ability to use language in creative and innovative ways. They can play with words and sentence structures to create new meaning and convey emotion, which is not trivial for robots. Other aspects of literary writing is that they can they can challenge you to think critically about the world. And through their writing, they can inspire you to broaden your perspective. 
and overall literary writers can move and inspire us and challenge us to see new meanings in the world and help us understand ourselves and our place and those of robots in the world. It's not hard to see why I like working with writers so much. And then why it also makes total sense when designing these interactions with robots. So it's, it's been about six years now that I started my PhD research tasked with developing Hero, the companion robot for children with cancer. And the project proposal nicely described all the technical features the robot should have. But not, nowhere was described how these interactions should look like or where the content needed to come from. So that's when I approached the writers. And luckily I didn't need a lot of convincing for them to collaborate with me. A collaboration we call Robot Stories. And tonight I would like to share a few examples with you about how working with these writers influenced me and my research. So they can create of turn this, excuse my language, lifeless piece of plastic into a lovable character. They can create these captivating narrative conversations that keep in children interested in the robot for months. And we all know how quickly children lose interest. And I guess that applies to most of us when a shiny new toy doesn't shine anymore. And the better the robot is able to keep children engaged, the more sustainable and effective these stress interventions or educational activities are. And Robot Stories has been a transformative experience for all of us. I started thinking more in terms of stories and the writers started thinking more like programmers. And the powerful thing about Robot Stories is that we don't write in isolation. We go to the hospitals and schools and involve children and we go to the elderly home and involve the elderly and care workers. And that transforms us all again. It enabled us to incorporate the actual needs and values of all the people involved, and not just fictional ones. Writers are also excellent speculators. Sure, everyone can come up with these apocalyptic scenario, but how to shape a more realistic and optimistic tomorrow? So by situating themselves amongst the people and the robots, Writers can safeguard the needs and values of everyone involved and pave the, pave the way forward. And as we speak, writers are talking to people with dementia and the care workers and robot programmers. They're writing down their individual stories and those individual stories are the source material for speculative scenarios that describe possible futures of how people with dementia, their loved ones, care workers, can meaningfully in interact with these robots. And I think I need my clicker at this moment. That's me. And however big or small these interactions may be. We also took the robot to the theater and explored the more performative side of storytelling. Together with the puppeteer and the dancer, we explored the movements of the robot. And this robot, for example, can stand up by itself when it falls over. It's a standard functionality, it takes about 30 seconds. But when playing around in the theater, we discovered that you can change the setting, uh, the speed setting of this getting up sequence. And if you put it to 1%, it takes about eight minutes to get up. It's like watching a snail crossing the road. But who would have thought we could get an entire audience to watch an utter silence when this robot slowly got up? It's the power of staging. A dark theater with a bright spotlight on the robot. Yeah, there's something we can learn from the theater when designing these interactions with the robot. And the interesting thing was this though. At 1% speed, the robot was able to complete the whole sequence, except the final motion. It lacked momentum and fell over again. And the audience 
was furious. So, yeah. But the most fulfilling thing of my job is to take these robots into the world and do so-called user studies. And I would like to share uh, some anecdotes from these user studies. So once going to a school, I could set up the robot in the gym, and this, this gym had a, a big window conveniently positioned next to a playground. You can probably guess where this is going. I literally had to stack gym mats to cover the windows because children would glue their faces to the window to get a glimpse of the robot. And some started even bonking on the, robot, on the windows to get the robot's attention. And surprisingly, this was no different when visiting an elderly home. They too took every chance they got to peek into the room where the robot was located. Not to say that they behave childishly, but rather that people remain curious throughout their whole life. We should nourish that. And when working with people with dementia, we use this robot. And this robot we call Memo. You can probably figure out why it's called like that. Not everything the writers come up with is as deep as and clever. And I also want to share some memorable moments from the elderly home with you tonight. So, for example, the speech recognition ability of Memo doesn't work perfectly, especially with this target population. So the people there had to help Memo at times by repeating an answer or using its tablet. And of course, this is very frustrating if this happens often. But if it happens sometimes, it had a totally different effect. When talking to one of the elderly residents after their conversation with Memo, they told us, although not in these exact words, that they liked being not the least cognitive able person in the room. This was a humbling experience, because when you think about it, especially in the early stages of dementia, you're very much aware of your own cognitive decline, and you are confronted with it on a daily basis. So interacting with a struggling robot provided an opposite experience for once. And embracing the limitations of the robot rather than hiding them became a common theme for us. We created story worlds. And a story world is a transmedia narrative that positions the robot into a fictional world but links it to the real world. So we create a story, we create a, a story character for the robot, ascribing it personality and traits, but also taking into, into account its actual cognitive and physical capabilities and limitations. And we also create these fictional goals the robot wants to achieve uh, in the fictional world, for example, become Olympic champion. But also we give it real world goals it wants to achieve, like distract you from stressful moments in the hospital. So Memo, can you tell us what you can, cannot do and, and would like to do? Well, I cannot smell because I have no nose. See, I also cannot take long walks on the beach. Unfortunately, it would grind up all my wheels and gears. I just want to know how the forest smells like and how the sand feels like. Yeah, that's unfortunately for you, Memo. But luckily, I brought a jar of forest and a jar of sand from the beach so I could smell it for you and touch it for you and describe it to you. And this is what we did in the elderly home as well. So Memo would ask if people there would like, would like, would like the forest more or the beach more. And then based on their preference, Memo would ask them this same question. Can you smell the forest for me? And we brought the same jars and people would smell, the, smell it and describe the smell to, hear, to, to Memo. And Memo would ask, oh, what is your favorite moment from the forest? And people would tell Memo. And we learned from the care workers afterwards that some people told stories they never had heard before. And I'm not claiming that our approach really uh, fixes pe people's memories. The sample size was too low for that anyway. But rather that there is potential for the robot to stimulate people to tell different stories than they normally do. And if you have loved ones with Alzheimer's, for example, you know that they tend to tell the same stories and over and again. So imagine if Memo sometimes would join a family visit and ask these strange questions 
it might facilitate a different conversation between family members. I cannot ask, you know, can you smell something from me? That would be weird. And that people might even think I was fooling them. But the robot doesn't have that limitation. So all these examples that I just gave are, at least for me, proof of what a meaningful interaction looks like. It's just something that goes a little bit deeper than the normal things we aim for these robots to achieve, that have actual value for people. And I don't think I would have been able to do this all alone, without the writers, without the direct involvement of the children and the elderly. And I also don't think that an AI system can generate these rich conversations and story worlds for the robot without a true understanding of the human experience and without being physically situated in these contexts. So, as an AI researcher, I say, not everything has to be solved with AI. Thank you.